this. Today, we are now giving another focus to one of our running series. How fast is it running? Well, we used to have a lesson a month on this, and then after everything I mentioned, it's been six months since we've had a lesson on this topic. From the wisdom, the poetry literature of the Psalms to help us in our prayer life. Every one of us needs to improve in this every day, and it's a journey for all of us. And I want to emphasize strong relationships are strengthened by good communication. They reinforce the other. Communication is one valid way or gauge to, of equating the quality of the relationship. If our communication with another is minimal, shallow, and trivial, our relationship with that person probably is as well, no matter our shared past. Consider it this way. If we are honest, we do not pray to God as often as we should and could. And it's possible we could be fooling ourselves with an idea that our present relationship with God is as good right now as it presently possibly can be. And besides, God knows everything about us anyway. But you know something? The truth is, if our prayers to God are infrequent and minimal, and shallow, and trivial. That can also indicate that our relationship with God is described by the same terms. I recently heard a quote, I think it was where I guest visited last week, where Brendan often speaks as well, that the biggest room there is in the world is the room for improvement. And isn't that the case? We can all improve in this way. And God wants so much more for us out of our prayer life that we sometimes hinder and keep from ourselves. So this uh, lesson series helps us to relate to God and communicate to God, I should say, in more meaningful and deep ways. And that will only help our relationships with others as well. So far in our series, and it's after six months it's worth doing this, uh, we have focused on these ideas. We first established the idea that it's not a requirement to pray exactly like they do. But here's the thing. If we study the Word and live it out, our petitions and our pleas to God are going to end up sounding a lot like the psalmists naturally. We have reviewed from the very beginning how they viewed God. How did the psalmist view God? He, was the, he is the creator, the source, the judge, the king, shepherd, ever-present, ever-loving. Those are complimented in Ron's Sunday morning class on the revelation. I hope you're here for that. We have studied how the psalmist viewed themselves in relation to God. We are often called cheap, and that's not always flattering. The psalmist viewed prayer in very specific ways. It was absolutely necessary. And prayers were heard, and they did work. And that is a self-contained lesson, of course. We studied how they prepared for prayer. They knew that they would be giving a lifetime of prayer devoted to this, so they would live out the Lord's will, and that helped prepare them for the next prayer. We studied how they ultimately had one goal in their prayer, and that was no matter what they said, did, thought, it was to praise God. And we will have to pull that theme into our study today. We studied last time, six months ago, of how they rigorously were, no, how they were rigorously open, honest, and candid. That was one in the whole series I frankly enjoyed presenting the most and studying for. Uh, I thought about letting the next study be from one of the original source material books I referenced. A great study was given, and I made an outline for it. I'll make it available for you as you exit if you'd like to complete your collection in this way, if you have a binder somewhere. But... How they were decidedly and or decisively creative in their prayers. They were purposeful in wanting to bring word pictures and, and creative imagery to their prayers so that they don't just say, God, I can't put it into words, but I'm glad you understand, so here's my prayer. Well, well, that's a cop-out in some ways, if we truly can't. But the idea is they tried, and I encourage you to do the same and enjoy that study on your own time. But as of right now... I pray we keep maturing in all these ways that we've mentioned, but now is the time to focus on the next dynamic of prayer. It's what comes after. After the prayer. If you end it formally like we sometimes do in the corporate assembled setting, amen, in Jesus' name, amen, by his name and authority, this prayer is petitioned before the throne of grace. If you end it that way or not, what comes after? Here's a simple question for the day. 
and everything we'll say will emphasize what's already clear and obvious. Are we making the same commitments as the psalmist? Their relationship was so matured that with steady communication, they reinforced their commitments to God, to giving Him what He deserves. And that will bless us as well. So point one, the psalmist, they, just, they didn't just know or suspect they would do this. They vowed to give thanks to God. Their words indicate that they knew they just did not have this entitlement mentality that is so prevalent today. This idea that I deserve blessings just because I have been created by God. That's not the mindset. They had a very humble perspective that they, they were simply going to thank God for the blessings that they had. And they were going to thank God for the blessings they knew He would give according to His grace and His will. And yet they, they knew God was going to provide for their blessings, yes. But they didn't feel entitled to it. They were just committed to giving the Lord thanks no matter what. And they were encouraging others to do the same. It's enforced by these psalms. And you can notice the repetitive words and themes. I will give to the Lord the thanks that is due to His righteousness. O oh Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Not just today, but forever. Even if things don't go my preferred way. I'll still give thanks to you, Lord. Psalm 57, 9. I will give thanks to you, O oh Lord, among the peoples. And I will sing to you among the nations. That is its key for later. It's, that, it's not that I want the attention. It is truly that I want others to see that I'm putting the spotlight on you, Lord. Same thing. I give thanks, O Lord, among the peoples. Everyone who knows me will know that I'm praising you, Lord. And hopefully that can be said of us. Another one. 118. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. We'll have to borrow that theme. He is good. And so this idea of praising God is a good deed indeed. And praising God is not for show, but it will show, and it must. In fact, in the Levitical Code, there is association with this expressed thanksgiving in a worship setting as well. And under the New Covenant, thankfully we're under the New Covenant, where we don't worship what they did back then, but we're still worshiping the same God under Christ's covenant. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and this is an idea of daily worship, instructs us to simply give thanks in all circumstances. I think our minds are so conditioned in this world, affected by sin and opposition to righteousness, that we challenge ourselves to, th to ask the question too instantly after reading the verse, how can I give thanks in this adverse circumstance? But instead, just simply hearing the text and applying it will challenge our minds to focus on the blessings we already have, both physically and spiritually, in the Lord, and then to f condition our minds to look for the good and what is eternal, no matter the adverse circumstances, right? So this is an application of 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Simply to give thanks in all circumstances. And I reference the account in Luke chapter 17. You know the account of the ten lepers who were healed by the incarnate Lord. And only one came back to offer thanks, to express gratitude in their heart for the healing that Jesus provided. We don't want to be like those nine who did not. We want to be that one who came back to the Lord for the greater spiritual blessing. To pray like the psalmists is to commit to giving the Lord thanks. As we continue, let's look at the next idea here. The psalmist also vowed to praise God. You notice this? There is a connection here. Thanksgiving to God and praising God. You think it's one and the same, and, and it certainly is one. Well, it's symbiotic in the relationship. They mutually reinforce the other. But thanksgiving, thanksgiving and, and praising are a little different. Here's the key difference, at least one key difference that I will stress. Thanksgiving to God is adoring God for all He has done and all that we know He will do because He is God. But that's the idea. Praising God is adoring God for who and just what He is. And that's the difference you'll notice in these psalms. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. 
O Lord, my lips, open my lips, and what will happen? My mouth will declare your praise. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will extol in you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Thank you. And every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. And I have to give kudos to my wife because she has a skill that I cannot. It's focus on every little detail uh, with the logistics of the tech crew. She has volunteered most recently often with making sure everything is in sync with the slides. And I cannot do that with songs. I get so focused on the meaning of the words I forget, and then the song just drops says we all don't know what we've seen next. What's, what's the next stanza here? So thank you, my wife. I appreciate that very much. Do we get the idea, though, from these songs, now displayed on the screen, that from the Hebrew poetry, this is poetry, Hebrew poetry and wisdom literature, that the psalmists realized they simply could not praise God enough. But you know something? They're sure going to try. That's the spirit I see in these psalms. If we will pray like the psalmist, we will commit to continued praise. And that Hebrews 13 reference says we must continually offer that sacrifice of praise, a fruit of the lips to God. Do you have that spirit of the psalmist? Did you walk in today with that? If not, I hope you leave here today with that. And then number three, the psalmist vowed, as we mentioned and heard in a prayer in some of the songs, obedience, obedience. Lifelong faithfulness does not and is not intended to be left to chance. You're vowing this to the Lord no matter what, upon obedience to the gospel, of course. This psalmist and these psalmists did not believe that they could just lay their petitions before the Lord and go about their merry little way. No, when you're coming before the authority of the Lord for a petition, you recognize certain relationships and roles that are in play. During one of our songs, I had to realize to myself, our role in life is to praise God. Every bit of it is to glorify God. So when we come to God, we have to understand this practical principle. Why on earth would we expect Him to listen to us if we're not going to listen to Him? And this is echoed in some of these songs as well, their commitment. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, that's a common phrase, and we may not associate it in this context, but think of it. His house. We sometimes joke and say, my roof, my rules, right? Something like that. Well, it's his house. It's his way that rules the day, and I will dwell in his house. But as for me... But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. See that? No matter what, I will walk in the upright path of righteousness. And Psalm 101, I will ponder the way that is blameless. It doesn't just mean I will do whatever I want and think about, you know, what God says and how I'm not doing it. No, I will ponder the way. That's the path I will pursue. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk in my integrity of heart within the house or my house. Psalm 116, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Again, all the focus is his way. And Isaiah chapter 66, oh, wow. This really drives home the point. This is an Old Testament reference in the category or context of Old Testament worship. But again, the principles apply. Just listen to verses 3 and 4 here. You worship God one way, but you're not living in accordance with His will. So how does He receive that worship? Or does He? He who kills a bull, it's as if He slayed a man. He who sacrifices a lamb, as if He breaks a dog's neck. If he offers grain offering, okay, but he might as well have offered basically a pig. You see that? He who burns incense, he might as well worship or bless an idol, and we know how he feels about idolatry. Just as, he has, as they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions. Like, all right, I'll let them, I'll let them, and bring their fears upon them. Why? Because when I called, no one answered. And when I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes and chose that which I do not delight. Sometimes the God of the Old Testament gets a bad rap for his just vindication, uh, uh, vengeance against the sin that should not have been done. It's the judgment of God that is seen. So we know how he feels against sin. It's the same God of the new covenant. We see that in Christ. If we're in Christ, we don't receive that wrath. But if we're outside of Him, we do. It's the same idea, the same worship concept here. The principle is our worship to God is empty. It's useless if our hearts are not open to His will. So only God knows. 
if our worship and presence today is in vain. And I hope it's not. His sovereign reign needs to be over our hearts and souls. So if we refuse to listen to God, we should not expect Him to listen to us. But if we thank God like the psalmist, if we praise God and obey God like Him, we will commit fully to Him. So with that being all in place, we've got the last devotional point here. The psalmist vowed to proclaim God to all. Proclaim God to all, and I mean to everyone. He doesn't leave out any group of people or any individual. Their faith in God and their love for His goodness. I've narrowed it down to their faith in God and their love for His goodness. Because of that, they were able to, and they were not going to, keep themselves from praising God to all. This is a passage, and I'm just going to put them all on the screen in this case. I'm just going to read straight through. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. I will tell of your name to my brothers, my fellow countrymen, the Israelites, the Jewish people, the nation. And in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. He says, you have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of your deeds and yet there are more than can be told. He's like, there's more than I can tell, but I'm sure going to try to tell as much of, it, of, as, as, much of it as I can. And then Psalm 109. With my mouth I will give great thanks to you, O Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng. So within and from without, he doesn't leave out any group. The world. Let me put this in the form of a question. <laughs> Has the world convinced you or encouraged you to develop the habit of silence? Has the world conditioned you to keep your faith private? And what that really means is, don't tell anyone. If so, I would encourage you to let the Word have more influence on your habits and your perspectives than the world. And certainly we have to be wise in how we represent God at all cases. But we should proclaim to others what God has done for us. And we all can do this more. We need to commit to doing this more. And I'm there with you. Take those opportunities that you will cherish for eternity and not regret forever. There is a distinction here in the Psalms, and I don't know if it's my emphasis or if it's what I see. Sometimes it's very hard to discern the difference if it's in the text or if I want it to be there. But from all the verses that we've read, there's a distinction I will emphasize. The psalmists did not say in any of these so far that I will tell the world what, the God, what God requires of them. Now certainly that's included for those who are interested and that see God in us and want to learn. Uh, that's not even, that's a given and it's not the focus. So the focus, the emphasis is this. They did not say, I'm going to make sure I tell everyone what you, what God expects of every person. No, it wasn't as much that as... The contrast, the psalmists rather were going to share the good news of what God has done for them. Huh. I've often said it before, that telling someone how to respond to the gospel is not necessarily telling them what the gospel is that motivates the desire to respond to. Are we aware of what the gospel is and how it has changed our lives? Do you think that the gospel would be more effective in our delivery of it if we put ourselves in the story and how the truth, living by it every day, if we are, has made a huge difference in our lives where we would be otherwise, where we came from before we came to Christ? Putting ourselves in the story, telling others what God has done for us, that is what we must proclaim. And in this context, I use the word testify, let people know. Telling others what God has done for you. Do you recall, and I, I think of this story once every two years, which means about 20% of the congregation may hear it or remember it, and it's good to remember every once in a while, the story of the young kid who saw a baptism, someone get baptized in the service. And the story is told of the young kid. When can I get advertised? When what we become a big billboard for Christ. I think about Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. I reference this because I find it intriguing 
that the man who was healed was specifically told by Jesus, don't yet tell anyone. And it's amazing what questions people will ask. Was it wrong for him to, to disobey the Lord in this case? Well, I mean, if you come up with a good article on that, I might read it. But my focus is the fact that this man had his life changed and he couldn't help but tell someone else about it, everyone about it. And that's the spirit that I'm emphasizing today. Don't misapply these illustrations. I just give you a huge disclaimer and make the point clear. It's not about us. Let's allow the prayers that we have be like the psalmist in this way. For all of our petitions be for providential opportunity to proclaim what the Lord has done for us. And in conclusion, at least for this study, um, just as we learned, it's not about what we do while we're praying, but also what we do before we pray. We must also learn, like the psalmist, it's just as much about what we do after we pray. And so let's resolve to make those same commitments that they did. Let's resolve to thank God and to praise God and to obey God and to proclaim God. Um, let's see. From my bezel, I've only gone 20 minutes at this time. And I have just a few moments I choose to take for your benefit. I provided it for you in print. But for the sake of the recording, and since it relates to this idea of commitment, I'm going to use a few words to lead into our invitation. During my guest visit at Pleasant Grove this last summer, uh, I preached on a assigned topic, God's plan for me. And the last third of that lesson, the latter third, uh, were represented by these screen slides. And I reminded them that committing to the Lord is worth anything you have to sacrifice because of the fact all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Eternal life is one of them. Forgiveness, to say the least. It's both humbling, let me pull that back up, I'm sorry. It's both humbling and empowering to admit or submit to God's purpose for your life. According to Ephesians 2.10, I get the idea that everything we do, everything we become, is all to the glory of God. I exist to glorify God. It's humbling and empowering to admit that. Our key motivation starts with gratefulness for being created and for the gift of salvation offered. Our love for the Lord only grows as we live for Him, and that motivates us to look forward to our ultimate reward. What is our ultimate reward? To be with God in full. Most people don't even think about eternity. They rarely think about today or tomorrow, much less. But if they do think about it, it's only in a selfish sense for what I can get out of life. For others, when they're presented with the idea of lifelong commitment to a path of righteousness, it can be intimidating for some people. Because all they've ever known is a life that goes against God's will. And it's like, I don't know if I can do that. But like Ron often emphasizes in, in my words, it's something like this. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Faithfulness to Christ is a one step at a time marathon. And the Lord helps you with every step of the way. So the rewards are certainly worth and preferred to the consequences alternatively. Let's think logically about this. Emphasized by the debate. Look at the facts. Think things logically through and hopefully make the right decision. Let's count the cost. What if I... What if I commit? What will I have to give? If I commit to the Lord, what will I have to give up? Oh, yeah, we don't hide it. You're going to have to give up some things like personal sovereignty. It's a hard sell for some people to realize that the king of kings now calls the shots, that the sovereign Lord rules all and has all authority, and that the omniscient God happens to know best. And when we know that, we appreciate him for it. But it's a hard sell. You have to eat all of the humble pie in order to accept that. I will have to give up as well personal uh, priority of possessions. It's no longer all about me. It's just that once I enter the kingdom, I realize that it all belongs to the king. He's the king. He owns it all. And everything I have, I'm just a steward. Hopefully to use in a way that through the prism of that is to his glory. So I'm no longer living based on the world's value systems, but by the word. What's the cost if I don't commit to Christ? Ooh, okay, cost-benefit analysis. What's the cost if I don't commit? Well, you will give up the best use of your life. Because God designed the purpose for life 
and it's His will for your life. And if you don't do that, that's giving up the best use of your life. You will also thereby give up the deepest satisfaction and joy that you could ever know, not just in this life, but the eternal joys of being in God's full presence. Well, that's enough for me to make, help you think about for a long time, but I hope you don't think about it too long before the opportunity is no longer here. After considering the benefit, the pros and the cons, what you have to, what, what the, uh, the cost-benefit analysis of either option, I hope that you make that final right choice to charge. Give it your all. C.S. Lewis had the quote that if Christianity, let's see, he said, the one thing that Christianity cannot be is moderately important. If it is the truth, it demands our everything, everything you've got. And I think about the inspired writer Paul. Yes, inspired Paul in Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to the Lord. This, this is your spiritual act of worship. Wow. Responding to the gospel. Your baptism, physical baptism into Christ, is a faith response. Mimicking the gospel and even by faith participating it so that the power of the shed blood on that day by the Lamb of God can cleanse your soul, offer that forgiveness, and provide eternal life, not just now, but from this point forward. I don't want you to become a Christian just because you may die tomorrow, but because you can live today the way that Lord has desired, and you can anticipate that reward of being with Him forever. Give God the glory for all things. Hope this message has been encouraging to you and has helped ultimately your prayer life and relationship with Him and with others. If you are in need of the Lord's invitation and blessing, we extend this now to help and assist as we stand and as we sing.